Good morning, everyone. It is Sunday, July 12th, 2020, and uh, we are here. You are there, and we are together in community once again uh, for worship. So welcome to you all, and uh, once again, we're gathering together in uh, this internet and online community. I have with me today Mary and Jane, who are here to help us uh, sing the hymns. And uh, I know now for a fact that some of you are at home actually singing the hymns instead of watching us perform them. And uh, I think that's wonderful. Um, even somebody told me they stand for the hymns, so that's even better. You're awesome people. Uh, we want to thank you very much for all your support, for tuning in every week, and even now, especially in the summertime, uh, we know that you're still watching, and that's super awesome. And uh, thank you also for continuing to uh, bring your donations into the church or sending them in on Canada Helps, uh, whatever, however works for you. Uh, we've been really appreciative of those donations. I just have a quick update for you on my story of the red convertible Volkswagen Beetle. And uh, I do have a line on a Beetle. Uh, the very next day after giving that sermon, somebody called me and said, I've got your bug. And uh, believe it or not, I knew what they were talking about. And um, anyway, I haven't purchased one yet. So if you are still milling around thinking about that and know of someone who knows someone, uh, give me a call. I'll be waiting to hear. We're now going to turn to David for the prelude. We gather in the light of Christ, we worship with the light of Christ, we carry the light of Christ with us, and so may the light of Christ fill our hearts and be with us in our worship here this morning. Here is our call to worship. We are called, each and every one of us, <clears throat> to this time and this place we have set aside for life and light and love. There has never been such a time as this. So come with generosity of spirit, come with hope-filled hearts, come with enthusiasm, with gusto, and with open-minded awareness. We are called by our Creator to listen for holy wisdom. We are called to listen for all that is sacred and holy. We are called to listen for the story beneath the story, the story that unites us all. We are called to be challenged and blessed so that we might live lives of authenticity and integrity. May it be so. We're going to begin with our hymn, which is number 260 in Voices United. It's just two verses long, God who gives to life its goodness. Thank you. 
Now for our prayers this morning, a moment of quiet in between uh, the uh, prayer that I give and then the Lord's Prayer, so plenty of time for you to offer your own prayers, or a different way of putting it is time for you to enter into the stream of prayer that is all around us. So let's take a moment for our prayer. Great Spirit of Oneness, great source of life and love, we are gathered in your spirit, we are gathered in your love. We open our hearts and our mouths, they are filled with songs and praise. We open our minds and our spirits, they are filled with the prayers of our hearts. As we gather in this sacred place together, our world beckon beckons us to carry the story that is so needed today. Our community, our circles of care, our partners and our friends, all beckon us to choose life, to embrace hope, and to be the change we wish to see in our world. So may this time together give us courage and strength for these tasks. Now in these quiet moments, let us take a few breaths and hold in our minds those who are dear to us, those whom we treasure. Let us hold those who are suffering or in distress and those enduring one of the many faces of grief. And let us hold in our minds those who need our prayers, the sick, those just home from hospital, those facing treatments of some kind. And let us shine a light of hope their way. And now I invite you to join with me in the words Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we're going to respond to the prayers with another hymn, and this one is in the More Voices hymn book. It's number 89. And if you don't have that hymn book uh, with you, uh, I hope that you have it at least printed out. The words are stunning and beautiful. It is called Love is the Touch.
Thank you. We're going to do a psalm reading today, Psalm 84, <clears throat> and there is a response for you to say along with me. Uh, some of you I know won't have that in front of you, uh, but I'll read it and then we'll say it together and then I'll go through the psalm. How glorious is your dwelling place, blessed maker of the universe. All that is within me longs to rest in your house. So that's the refrain. How glorious is your dwelling place, blessed maker of the universe. All that is within me longs to rest in your house. Even as the sparrow finds a home and the swallows their nesting place where its young are raised within sight of majesty, so does my soul long to dwell within your heart. Blessed are they whose hearts are full of love, who sing praises to you with grateful hearts. Blessed are they whose strength comes from your presence, for in your presence the joys and sorrows of the world are shared. Fear and doubt lose their sway. They are overcome by divine light and power. But those who dwell in the house of the beloved go from strength to strength. How glorious is your dwelling place, blessed maker of the universe. All that is within me longs to rest in your house. For a day within the home of love eternal is more to be desired than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a servant in your dwelling place than live in riches among those who do not know you. For with you, there is treasure, with you, strength. Your love is as powerful as the sun's rays. Your heart is as strong as a shield of steel. How glorious is your dwelling place, blessed maker of the universe. All that is within me longs to rest in your house. Well, since I was last with you, I read to you the Abrahamic covenant and a little bit of the beginning of the Abrahamic story, wherein uh, Abraham and Sarah were given the message that they were going to have a child. That child's name was Isaac. But as Abraham and Sarah had waited for so long, really for decades, to have a child, uh, Abraham fathered a child with one of the maidservants of the house, and that uh, maidservant's name was Hagar, and the child's name was Ishmael. Once Isaac was born to Abraham and Sarah, uh, you can imagine Sarah's consternation at having a, a, a half-child in the house. And so she asked Abraham to send Hagar and Ishmael out into the desert to die, basically. They didn't die, and uh, Ishmael went on to become the father of the Islam nation. Also, since we last met, and another story in between the one for today and the last one, uh, Abraham's nephew, Lot, became embroiled in the brouhaha that happened in the towns of Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, that goes on for a number of chapters in Genesis. And then at the end of it, when God decides to smite the two towns, having allowed uh, Lot and his uh, daughters to escape, um, there, as you know, is a story in there that is rarely talked about, but everybody knows uh, is in the middle of the, uh, the book of Genesis. So those two major stories um, are in between last time and this time. And so now our um, reading for today from Genesis 22. After all of this, as if that wasn't enough, God tested Abraham. God said, Abraham, yes, answered Abraham, I'm listening. He said, take your dear son Isaac, whom you love, 
and go to the land of Moriah. I want you to sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I'll point out to you. So Abraham got up early in the morning and saddled his donkey. He took two of his young servants with him and his son Isaac. He had split wood for the burnt offering. And so he set out for the place God had directed him. And on the third day, he looked up and saw the place in the distance. Abraham told the two young servants, you stay here with the donkey. The boy and I are going over there to worship and then we'll be back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and gave it to Isaac, his son, to carry. He carried the flint and the knife, and the two of them went off together. Isaac said to Abraham, his father, Father, yes, my son, we have flint and wood, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? Abraham said, Son, God will see to it that there's a sheep for the burnt offering. And so they kept on walking together. They arrived at the place to which God had directed him. Abraham built an altar. He laid out the wood. Then he tied up Isaac and laid him on the wood. Abraham reached out and took the knife to kill his son. Just then, an angel of God called to him out of heaven, Abraham, Abraham, yes, I'm listening. Don't lay a hand on that boy. Don't touch him. For now I know how fearlessly you fear God. You didn't hesitate to place your dear son on the altar for me. Just then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in the thicket. Abraham took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Abraham named that place Jehovah Jireh. That's where we get the saying, on the mountain of God, it will be provided. Quite an astonishing story in the book of Genesis. Well, many years ago, I received a poisoned pen letter. I'm not in the custom of receiving poisoned pen letters, and so it was one of those unique experiences that maybe only ministers have, and I don't know, maybe politicians too, I'm not sure. It was from a person who was extremely upset with the decision that our worship committee had made. Uh, that year, it was concerning Christmas Eve services or something. I don't remember all the details. But the person had taken the time to not only write the letter, but to seek out my home address and intentionally put a stamp on the letter and walk it to the post office. And like the intention of those actions, the words in the letter were pointed and direct, vehement and vitriolic. I guess it was meant to shame me. Now, because of the kryptonite tone of the letter, I put it in a drawer, and every once in a while, I would take it out to see if it still held that kind of kryptonite power over me. Eventually, I just had to stop pulling out the drawer, and eventually, I just let the darn thing go. Why didn't my poison admirer think twice before popping that letter in the mail. Why, when you compose an email in uh, anger or frustration in the middle of the night, do you press send instead of waiting till the morning? Maybe she would have changed the letter. Maybe she could have lessened the tone or better not sent it at all. Anyway... When it comes to Bible stories, we might wonder sometimes, why are they included? Why is this story included and that one left unheard? For there must be thousands of Bible stories not ever recorded. 
or heard. And then you have to question, what is the editorial policy of the Bible? I mean, didn't someone send back the drafts of these Genesis stories around Abraham and Sarah and all the failings of their family for correction and editing before publication? Why didn't an editor, let's say, take out the bad parts or change the story to make it more palatable? I guess we'll never know. So there's an old rabbinic saying about interpreting the Torah. Now you know the Torah is the first five books of the Bible. And the saying is that there are always 70 different faces to every word in the Torah. There are 70 different faces to every word in the Torah, which is why I guess that some Jewish scholars will spend their whole lifetime, their whole career, trying to understand the meaning of a particular verse of Torah. The nuance, the tone, even the silence between the words can have significant outcomes in the interpretation. And Hopefully, I guess, the idea is that over time, many of the 70 different faces of the words are revealed. Perhaps that, uh, how, perhaps that is how it is with Abraham and Sarah and the cycle of stories that is included in the Genesis account. Perhaps there are still more faces to reveal. But today... I'm going to admit right up front that this story that I just read to you about the near sacrifice of Isaac as a test put to Abraham by God could have done with some careful scrubbing before publication. Because the story is still shocking and our modern ears don't have the capacity to hear what it is trying to say. And so we're kind of aghast at the brutality of it, the building of the altar out of the sticks that Isaac carried up the mountain, the laying of the sun on top of it, and then the knife in his hand. We wonder how Abraham could be moved to follow such a command, and we shudder at the thought of a God that we thought was loving and kind requesting such a thing. I mean, the the death of an innocent child as a a test to someone's faith. I was thinking about my own kids who are now fully grown and in their 30s, and I was thinking about them, and maybe your kids too, if I knew them, and thinking that if we were to read this story to them, they would say, I'm sure, if this is who God is, then count me out. Not a lot of nuance in that response. After a funeral a few years ago, <clears throat> an attendee came up to me and told me that she went to a church which believed in the fundamental truth of each and every word of scripture. I was really impressed by this woman. I was impressed by her audacity as she carefully explained, explained to me the reasoning behind it. And I all the time was wondering, why is she telling me this? I think she was telling me that I had an inadequate view of scripture. And basically, she said that God is in control of every single moment of our lives. And if we listen, God will tell us in every moment exactly what we should do. And she quoted to me the story of Abraham's near sacrifice of Isaac as the premier example of this. I let her warm to her theme. Each word, she said, however awful or abhorrent to us, contains the fullness of God's truth, she said. And when we find the, the words maybe shocking or distasteful or incomprehensible, she said that's an awful lot more about us and our lack of understanding and certainly does not cast any judgment upon God whose fullness is revealed in every word. So, on the surface, I was kind of appalled and taken aback by her certainty, mostly because of the 70 faces of truth idea, which I figured she likely wouldn't grasp. Let's just say I didn't go into it with her. 
And with all the generosity of spirit that I could muster, I had to admit that she was entitled to her views. I just wish I didn't have to be on the receiving end of them. So here's the thing. The stories of Abraham and Sarah read as legends. They read as accounts of the old ancestors that we might tell of our long ago ancestors, maybe coming to this land and clearing the land and, you know, building the log cabin that they, that they first lived in, all of those kind of stories. And it those stories kind of build upon themselves and they, they take on a life of their own. And I think that most of the stories that we are reading in Genesis are not factually accurate or literally true. We don't really know if Abraham really even existed, but assuming he did, the fact is when these were written down, uh, during the Babylonian exile, or maybe just after that time, a thousand years had passed. A thousand years. So these stories were put down on paper a thousand years after the events that they are describing. And as soon as we see the truth of this, that these stories are likely prehistorical, legendary tales, we see the implications, right? Because I introduced you to the notion of Hagar and Ishmael, Ishmael being the father of the Islamic nation. Abraham, of course, being the father of all three uh, religions, Christianity, Judaism, and, and Islam. But the problem is that the many centuries of hatred and enmity between the Muslims and the Jews are based on the Ishmael banishment to the desert. And if that is just a legend, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. The same could be said of the story of Lot and his daughters and the destruction of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. As you know, long held by the anti-gay movement as proof of God's hatred of homosexuality in any form, you all know the stories, may in fact just be a mythical story told to protect girls in a culture of communal rape. It has nothing whatsoever to do with homosexuality. Many Jewish scholars of the Old Testament, and let's face it, most of the scholars of the Old Testament are Jewish, are steeped in the 70 faces of truth tradition. And they see that the real point of the Isaac or the Isaac story as describing the time when the ancient cult practice of uh, human sacrifice, uh, which was done to appease the angry f fertility gods of the pagan religions, um, describes a time when that was abandoned in favor of animal sacrifice. Now, we could debate animal sacrifice uh, for eons if we wanted to. But at one point, one of the editors of the book of Genesis, and there were four that we know of. So one of the four editors of the book of Genesis seems to have been a priest in the temple. And so what he did was he added or corrected some of the tales that are told there to make them line up with the temple traditions, which came about 700 years after Abraham's time. And so this writer would see the value in having Abraham, who was the highest authority in Judaism, condoning the practice of animal sacrifice. Anyway, I'm sure most of us on a summer Sunday morning don't really care about those kind of issues. But here's the thing. Um, like these stories, if we avoid them, which is what most of us do, uh, they just sit there unexamined. 
if we look at them, then we realize right away we have not brought our critical faculties to them in a long time. I mean, I remember learning about Isaac and uh, Rebecca and Abraham and Sarah in Sunday school and then never looking at them for decades. That's probably the same with many of you. These stories have a power and they make a claim on us because there's one thing that's absolutely for certain is they, we cannot be indifferent to these stories. We either hate them or we love them. We either cherish them or we want to put them in the garbage. So, what if we give ourselves permission to edit the stories again? So, we know the book of Genesis has been richly edited for centuries. What if we take it upon ourselves, perhaps, to do the sacred and holy thing, which is to ask ourselves, how might this story play out in our lives, in our context, and you know, make it relevant to us? So for the remainder of the sermon, I'm going to give you three scenarios. What I've done is I've looked at three things that I find abhorrent in the text, and then I've written three different endings. So the first one is this. So I believe that violence against children is abhorrent and morally repugnant. I also don't want the Bible seeming to condone it. Um, I don't believe that anybody is ever asked to hurt a child by God. God does not condone the killing of children. Now, I could spin out this to include the training of child soldiers in our day or uh, systemic racism, which keeps minority children in impoverished systems as a form of child abuse, or the former government policy in our own country of killing the Indian in the child. But I digress. Here's my point. As Abraham and... Yeah, Abraham and Isaac were walking up the mountain to make a sacrifice to God. They named all the beauty around them, the birds, the trees, even the sheep roaming on the faraway hillside. And as they were climbing the hill, a lump formed in Abraham's throat. Was it really true that God was asking him to sacrifice his own son? He reasoned, that no one would ever want to hurt their child in God's name. And so he thought, if push comes to shove, I would rather sacrifice myself. And I would do that for my son. I would lay down my life for him. It's as simple as that. And so Abraham asked God for a sign and just then a young ram appeared in a bush and so Abraham took Isaac into a clearing where instead he taught him how to start a fire, how to survive in the wilderness and how to reverence the food that they had found. What a great trip Isaac told his mother when they returned. Here's the second scenario. I believe that patriarchy is a problem. When the powers of economy, religion, politics, science, and technology all rest within the hands of very powerful men, the system can be racist and misogynist and classist and all those things when it controls all the systems of power without checks and balances. And I mean, Abraham is the classic patriarch of all three religions. Here's a different ending then. Abraham had a dream one night that he was to take his son Isaac up a mountain where he would kill him as a sacrifice to God. God was testing him and he wanted to see how great a leader he was. He woke up Sarah 
They discussed the merits of listening to the dream. Sarah said, why don't you talk to your brother Nahor and seek counsel from other men and women within the family? You shouldn't have to stake your honor on one foul deed. So Abraham sought wide counsel and received 70 different opinions on how to proceed. In the end, he went alone into the wilderness, and there he offered his own life as a sacrifice, as a way to show that he had made the best informed decision he could make with all his partners, including the women of the tribe, and all of whom who could not bear the thought of a child being made to pay for someone's sense of honor. Here's the third. I believe that the personification of God with heavy accents on male power and strength as a way in ancient times to trump the other gods of the neighboring religions is false. It's not fair to the creator of the universe whose presence and energy is all about growth, creativity, change, and transformation to be imprisoned in human language that is inadequate to the task. So the God of Abraham in the book of Genesis, let's just put it out there, is way too small a God and represents way too much of the cultural projections of the day in which the story was told. So here's an ending. As Abraham led his son up the mountain of Moriah, he was overcome with the transcendent beauty of the place and for the first time felt that his body was becoming one with his surroundings. His soul melted into the soul of his son Isaac and the two of them stopped in awe to admire all the gifts of life spread out before them. Abraham thought to himself, I am such a small speck in the order of things. I can't possibly know the goodness or greatness of God, but I do know that I am now a part of something much larger and more beautiful and more true. He looked down at Isaac and he prayed that at some point his son would learn this as well. And as they sat down around the fire they built, and ate the rations they had brought for the journey, Abraham could see that not only were they specks in a grand universe, but they were beloved specks in a grand universe. And then he thought of his son Ishmael, whom he had led out to the desert and realized that he too was a beloved speck. He resolved to find them and to make amends as soon as he returned. He also resolved then and there never to recount the story of the near sacrifice, never to Sarah, never to his friends, nor his relations, because what he wanted most of all was for the whole world to feel the same peace he held in his heart. And that was the legacy Abraham left for the generations. Well, I've given you three possible alternative endings. That means there are 67 more to discover. Over to you. Let me know what you come up with. Amen. And so, our last hymn for today is uh, number 227 in Voices United, number 227, and it is called For the Fruit of All Creation.
once again, thank you for being with us today. And uh, we'll see you next week here at same time, same place. And as we go, may the light of Christ live within us. May the light of Christ light our way before us. May the light of Christ hold us in the darkness and pain. And may the light of Christ be that which we share with one another in this world that we love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And our postlude now with David Fries.